Hello there, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of elementary statistics by learning how to implement some of these things we've been calculating in terms of the measures of central tendency, position, and variation, which are extremely useful for analyzing data sets. But what if the data set is extremely large? Then technology may be beneficial for us. So our video today is going to be primarily focused on how to implement these calculations in Microsoft Excel. So before I actually get into these calculations and showing you um, how to do some of the basics in Excel, uh, I just want to remind you that I will not be um, written on a tablet this time, and I will be uh, inputting data into Excel via a keyboard. So if you do hear any keyboards, uh, keyboard sounds, such as, that is pretty much what it is. Um, so if it is a distracting sound, I apologize ahead of time. Um, just try to think of the sound as statistics in Excel, ASMR. So with that being said, let's get started. So before we can start analyzing data, we first need a data set to analyze. So let's assume that we want a bunch of random numbers from 1 to 1000. Excel has a function that can easily generate this for us. So the function that we're going to use is equals rand between. So this will construct a random number between, let's say, 1 and 1000. So that's that particular number. So if we want a bunch of these random numbers, we click that cell that we just calculated, click the solid little right box in the bottom right hand corner, click and drag that down until you have all of the elements that you want. So this is going to be my random data set. Now there is a slight downside to this because every time you manipulate this spreadsheet, notice that my data values do change, right? Because they are indeed random. So they're random on every instance of this uh, spreadsheet as well. So what we want to do is we want to copy those values at that particular instance, and then go over to here where we're going to paste it, right click and then paste the values there. Then when we manipulate this data set, notice that the values do not change anymore. Therefore that is gonna be the data set that we're going to work with. And let's assume that that data set is indeed a sample data set. So for fun, we're going to, let's uh, just center justify, give it some color, um, so it's a little bit more entertaining to look at. So a couple of the things that we're gonna be calculating is, let's assume we want to calculate the sample size, let's call that N. Uh, let's also assume that we want to calculate the number of values in this set that are greater than or equal to 200. Um, or 300 or whatever you want. Um, and let's assume we want to calculate a more specific type of uh, property, say greater than or equal to 200. And let's assume we want to calculate all the values that are less than 100, right? So we can calculate those things. Um, now, before I get into these uh, different types of functions, I just want to mention some other counting techniques um, that you might be aware of. For example, uh, permutations, uh, combinations and derangements. These were uh, two of the basic things. Oh, also factorials. Uh, these are often used. So if I want to do the factorial of four, uh, that's going to be equal to fact four. So that's going to be four times three times two times one. Uh, so that's going to be equal to 24. Let's assume we have um, 20 objects. So we're going to permute 20 objects, but we're only going to choose five of them. Um, so how many permutations of those five objects does exist? That's going to be that big number. Let's assume we have 10 objects and we're going to permute them five ways such that the order does not matter. That's going to be equal to 252. Now derangements do not have a nice little formula. So let's just talk about a couple of those pieces. So the very first thing is we need to round down the value of the factorial of n divided by e plus one half. So this is gonna be equal to, so we're gonna floor it. So floor means round down. And then we're gonna do the factorial. Let's assume we want to find the value of, say, the derangement of five objects. And remember what the derangement means. We're, that just means the, the permutations of those objects and you're not allowed to be in the same position that you started in. So that's gonna be five factorial divided by e to the power of one, which is just e, but um, Excel doesn't know the difference between the letter and the number. Um, then plus one half which is I'm just going to do 0.5, and then close parentheses, and that gives us 44, uh, which is the same answer that we got in the example that we did before. So these are some of the things that you can do in Excel very easily. And now let's look at how we can calculate um, the sample size uh, and specific subsamples if we really want to. 
So n is just going to be equal to count a to a. So this is going to count all the values in column a that are numerical. So it's not going to calculate this label sample x and all the blank cells that fall below it. So once we press enter, that means we have 19 values. Now, if we want to put some specific criteria on that count, this is going to be count if. So we're going to look in all the values in a, comma, then the criteria we want. So we want to count all the values that are greater than or equal to 200. Uh, put double quotes around that, close parentheses, and that's how many there are. Which means there are two values in this data set that are less than or equal to 199 and greater than or equal to 1, based on how we set up our problem. Um, if you want multiple criteria for that, that's going to be equal to count ifs. You can have 2, 3, 4, 5, 50 criteria if you really want to. Again, we're going to look in A to A. We want all the values to be greater than or equal to 200. And then we want to look in the same exact place. Uh, oh, don't forget the double quotes. Then look in the same exact place. And then I want all of the values also to be less than 700. And this will give you the number of values in that particular set. All right, so those are some of the basics um, that we want. So now let's get into the actual uh, calculations of some of the common metrics of central tendency, position, and variation that we have discussed so far. Now let us begin by listing some of the common metrics that we have discussed so far. So I'm going to have a little column called metrics, and then I'm going to have those values associated to those x metrics. I'm going to have a data set of values of y in a little bit, um, so I just want to uh, distinguish between um, those particular values. So what are some of the measures of central tendency that we have discussed? So we have the arithmetic mean. Uh, some people just call it the average, and that's fine. We also have the medium. We have the mode. We have the mid-range. We have the geometric mean. Um, so those are common measures of central tendency. Let's just give them a little color just to group them together. Let's give them the color orange. Um, then we have, for example, the quartiles, Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. Some people refer to these as the five number summary for a data set, but you know, there's no reason. Um, you can't tell everything from the quartiles because other things give information too, um, but that's okay. They can name it whatever they want as long as it's appropriate. Uh, and then um, you can also do percentiles, but I'm not going to do that, and I'll give a brief explanation why. Uh, once I get there. Uh, and then we have the range, we have the interquartile range, we have the variance, we have the standard deviation, we have the coefficient of variation as well, um, we have the sum of absolute differences, the average absolute deviation, and we also have the sum of squared differences, which are some common metrics that we usually use for data sets. Um, so let's just get started with calculating some of these things. So the average is just going to be equal to average of my first column data set, so average A to A. And then median is going to be equal to median A to A. Mode is just going to be equal to MAO equals M-O-D-E A. Now notice that it gives us this little thing, don't be scared, that just means no values repeat in our data set. For example, if I were to put 177 there, it would now tell me that the mode is 177, right? But let's just delete that because it didn't really exist in my data set. Uh, Mid-range is going to be the average of the minimum and maximum. So we're going to do maximum of A to A and put this in parentheses on the top. Then the minimum of A to A, and then divide that by 2. That's the mid-range. Then the geometric mean is just going to be equal to geo mean, A to A, and that's that. Keep in mind, for the geometric mean, you cannot have negative values. So if I put negative 2 here, uh, that's going to give me an undefined value. I know even though uh, when you multiply negative 2 and negative 3, you get positive 6, and hence the product is positive, it still will not calculate it. Because remember, the data values for a data set must be positive in order for the geometric mean to be defined. Um, the quartiles, so Q0, this is going to be equal to the minimum. Q4 is going to be equal to the maximum. Q2 is going to be equal to the median. Now, Q1 and Q3, remember we have two variations, the inclusive and the exclusive versions. So when you type in equals quartile dot, you then have two options, exclusive or inclusive you choose. Um, so let's go with the exclusive version. Again, A to A, comma, which quartile do you want? I want the first quartile, so the 25th percentile as they call it. And Q3, this is going to be equal to quartile dot exc. And I want A to A, I want the third quartile. 
They call it the 75th percentile. Again, keep in mind, now, although they do call it the um, 45th percent or 75th percentile, so quartile.exe, uh, A to A, notice it says median 50th percentile of third quartile, 75th percentile. Uh, usually by the standard definitions of percentiles, usually these are not the same. Um, but again, as long as you're staying consistent with your definitions, there should be no problem. Um, but usually percentiles and quartiles in terms of quarters usually are a little bit different when the data set is small and usually shouldn't be used anyway when your data set is less than 100 elements anyway. So just keep that in mind um, and stay consistent with your definitions. So my range. This is going to be equal to my maximum value minus my minimum value. My IQR is going to be the difference of my interquartiles, Q3 and Q1. My variance has two different versions, the population and the sample version. So variance is going to be VAR dot, choose S for sample, P for population. I have a sample, so I'm going to do S, and that's going to be A to A. And then my standard deviation, you can either do the square root of that number we just calculated, or you can do equals STDEV dot S of the data set, and that will give it to you also. Also remember, if you want a population standard deviation, do stdev.p, and that will give you sigma. It will give you the same answer. Um, regardless if you take square root of variance or just do stdev.s, it should be the same. Coefficient of variation is going to be equal to the standard deviation divided by the arithmetic mean, uh, usually. Um, usually we do not write this as a percent unless we really want to write it as a percent. Um, but for coefficient of variation, there's no requirement that this number is in between 0 and 1. So... Um, writing it as percentage uh, usually has no deep meaning unless you give it deep meaning. Now, the sum of absolute differences in the other two are, there's no formula for, so I guess that's one downside of uh, Excel. And also, I'm not doing percentiles, because if you type in percentiles equals percentile, uh, we have exclusive versus inclusive. Um, of course, I could define which one uh, these are and which one we use. Um, but one downside of Excel is you do not necessarily know what is going on behind these functions. So that is one motivation of why you should learn uh, higher level statistics languages such as R, Python, MATLAB, or whichever platform you use, SPSS, SAS, for example, um, so you can have more control over what you're calculating. Um, so since, uh, you know, let's assume we don't know what's going on behind these functions, we're not going to use it just to be safe. All right, so let's create some functions uh, that we want. So we're gonna do these three calculations manually just to show you how you would actually go about it just in case you really wanted to know. So for the sum of absolute differences, what we first need to do is find out our absolute differences. So in particular, x minus x bar. And for our sum of square differences, SSD, we're just gonna be doing uh, x minus x bar, the quantity squared, All right? And then we're gonna add up those values in each of those columns, and that's gonna be SAD and SSD. So for absolute value bars, that's going to be ABS, open parentheses, and then we're going to take our X value and subtract our arithmetic average, our arithmetic mean. So keep in mind when we click and drag this value, we do not want this mean location to change. So we need to anchor that by putting dollar signs around or before and after the letter location of the address of the value for which we are referencing. So once we do that, once we press enter, and then we can click and drag this down just like we did for our random values. Notice that the values for these first locations did change, but the value of my arithmetic mean did not change. And that's exactly what we want. Similarly, this is going to be equal to, we're going to do open parentheses, x value minus arithmetic mean, the quantity to the power of 2. Since we want our arithmetic mean location to stay fixed, we're going to put dollar signs before and after the letter value of the location for that cell. And then we're going to click and drag that down. And those are going to be R squared differences. So the sum of absolute differences is just going to be equal to the sum of the values in column B. And the sum of squared differences is just going to be the sum of the values in column C. Uh, so what is the average absolute deviation of the data set? Well, that's just going to be the sum of absolute differences divided by my sample size 19, and that's going to give us 232.13 approximately. And what do we usually do with the sum of square differences? Yes, it has applications other than the variance, 
But let us assume we want to calculate the variance from this. It's going to be the sum of square differences divided by the sample size minus 1. And that's going to give us our variance, which notice is the same exact number that we got using the Excel formula. So at least the Excel formula is doing what we want on that regard. So that is definitely a big plus. So now that we have our basic metrics associated to single variable analysis, let us just do uh, a couple examples and let's go into the uh, two-dimensional realm uh, just briefly, just to see how to do things there. So now what I've gone ahead and done is I've created just another random set of numbers from one to a thousand, uh, so we can do some two-dimensional analysis um, between some data that let's assume we collected. So one of the first measures of uh, variation that we discussed in terms of two-dimensional data, uh, data would be the covariance of a set of data set. And then we also have the, um, the correlation coefficient uh, between my data set. So the correlation coefficient of my data set. I have my uh, coefficient of determination, uh, which is just R squared. Uh, and then we also have our sum of squared residuals, right? So our sum of squared residuals. Um, so how can we get our sum of squared residuals? Well, we first need um, the slope of our line of best fit and our vertical intercept of best fit. So we're just going to go ahead and go through the motions of how to calculate these things. Um, and that pretty much uh, should be everything aside from the uh, graphical representations of data sets. Um, so of course, uh, if we want to do a scatter plot uh, of these two data sets, we can select both of these and then click uh, scatter. Uh, that will create a scatter plot. And if we sort of look at this, we don't really have a correlation between X and Y, so we should expect our correlation coefficient to be somewhere between, uh, say, negative 0.5 and 0.5, um, or maybe even a little bit lower or just a little bit higher. We don't know. Um, but definitely not something close to 0 0.99 or something like that. So uh, let's go through and see if we can calculate all of these things. So, so the covariance, if this is indeed a sample, sample is going to be equal to covariance dot s. If you want a population covariance, that's going to be dot p. And then we're going to select our data in column 1 or column a, and then our y data in column d. So our correlation coefficient, remember, is going to be equal to the covariance divided by the product of our standard deviations. So it's going to be stdev.s of a times stdev.s of d, right? And that gives us negative 0.02, right? That's really close to zero, right? Now, there is an easier way to go about this instead of doing it the hard-coded way. You could do equals correlations, so C-O-R-R. E L of A to A comma D to D, and it will give you the same exact number. So the correlation is just corel A to A. Um, another function that gives you the same answer is equals Pearson um, for a statistician that originally studied this in detail. Okay, so the coefficient of determination is going to be equal to that number squared, um, which is pretty close to zero. Um, so in terms of the strength of the line of best fit, eh, it's pretty weak. So, uh, for our slope of the line of best fit, this is going to be equal to the covariance divided by the variance of x, which we've already calculated over here. So that's going to be my slope of the line of best fit. And my vertical intercept is going to be my y bar minus mx bar. So we need to calculate the uh, y mean. So this is going to be the average of column D. Um, so B is going to be equal to Y bar minus M times X bar. So that is our vertical intercept for our line of best fit, right? So now let us calculate my residuals for a particular X value. So this is going to be equal to, remember, the distance from Y to the approximated value of Y, right? Um, so what we need to do, actually, probably a better uh, way to go about it, is let's calculate y hat, okay? So this is going to be equal to y equals mx plus b. So this is going to be y is equal to m times x plus b, right? So remember, m and b are fixed constants, so we need to fix those um, before we click and drag that down. So y equals m, 
x plus b. And then we're going to click and drag that down. And the residual is the difference between y and y hat. So our predicted and our obtained y values, right? So then our residual squared, our residual for x squared is just going to be equal to our value minus y hat, the quantity squared. And then we're going to click and drag that down. And notice these numbers are really big. So remember, if the sum of squared residuals is close to zero, the line should fit very closely. And if the sum of squared residuals is really large, then the data does not uh, likely follow a linear trend. Right? So those are some of the basics associated to two-dimensional analysis. Now you may be wondering, well, can you also look at box plots? And the, of course the answer is yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight my first data set and my second data set, and you can go to, let's see where it is, I believe it's here, ah, yes, I go into the little histogram tab and click box and whisker, and it's going to create your um, box and whisker plots in the vertical orientation. So zero to 1200, these are all of your values. Um, so it looks like um, this data is skewed to the left, and you can see that because the X is corresponding to the median value, the center bar is the median. This is going to be Q0. Q1 is somewhere around 500. Um, Q3 is somewhere near, uh, let's say, 850, 900. And Q4 is somewhere close to 1,000. We've already calculated all of these things over here, and we should be able to see that these do um, verify according to this box plot. Um, but the bottom is Q0, then Q1, where it lines up to the number. Uh, the median is the bar, the x is the mean, so as long as the mean is less than the median, this will be skewed to the left. Um, and according to this, it looks approximately symmetric because the mean and the median is approximately equal to it, and I'm looking at the y values for that. So this is going to be the box plot analysis. This can give you some idea about the distribution of the data set as well. And of course, you can um, do class-based uh, frequency distributions. Uh, for either of these two data sets, you would just have to create your, for example, your lower bound, your upper bound, uh, and then you need to count um, how many uh, values, say fxk, um, lie between these two values. And you can use the count ifs command uh, if you want. And then from there, you can also count, uh, count, construct your frequency distribution, your relative frequency, your cumulative frequency, and your relative cumulative frequency distribution, and also construct the graphs of all of them. I will leave that as an exercise for you all, uh, but those are some of the basic statistics, uh, things that you can do in Microsoft Excel. Again, some of these things are a little bit tedious and probably would be a lot more appropriate in a more advanced programming language, but since Excel is readily available for a lot of people, I decided to do all of this in Excel for you all. So. This should give you at least some things to work out with without having to be burdened by learning a new programming language, um, but at least you have something to uh, help you out with some of these larger data sets. Anyway, that's, the, that's it for now, so I will see you in the next video. Take care.